Hello, I'm Oliver Cook. I'm a curator of horology here at the British Museum and welcome to my corner. So, first of all, I'll take off the weight because we don't want that clattering around. And a counterweight too. Now I can safely take the clock off the stand. And you can see on the back here, there goes the door. There's our little bracket for hanging it on the wall. So first of all, I'll take the side door off. And then I will take the hands off. And the beautiful, beautiful thing about this clock is I don't need any tools at all to take it apart, put it back together. So now the dial should come off. And I will now take these front wheels. This is what we call the motion work. These wheels are behind the dial and these drive the hands from the main mechanism. So we'll take those off. And then I'll take the back of the clock off. Have little pegs in here to come out. There we go. that up there. So we've got the clock down to its bare bones now. We can see a bit more what's going on. I think I will sit down now because it will, it'll help. So I said we'd have a little look at the striking train. This is the mechanism at the back here. So if I, if I, if I put this wheel of the motion work back on, which is necessary to show you this bit. So the, the minute hands on this square here, so it goes around once an hour, and this pin you see here comes up as we get towards the hour and starts lifting this lever, which we call a nag's head, because it looks a bit like a nag's head, and you'll see it nodding in a minute. And as we get up to the hour, the striking train will be released. Now, looking on the back of the clock, Obviously, somehow the clock's got to know how many strikes to strike at each hour. Three strikes at three o'clock, four strikes at four o'clock, and so forth. And to do this, it uses this device here, which we call the count wheel. And what you'll notice, it's got little slots around the edges that as we go around, the spacing increases. And that's the basis on which it counts. If I, if I set the clock off again and lift the lever, you'll now see this pin coming up. And every time you see that lifting, you'll hear a dong on the bell if the bell was on this clock, but it isn't. So it's, you see the little pin there feeling for the hole, but it, if it doesn't get it, it lifts up again until it finds the slot and then the striking stops. And that's how the striker system works. Other systems were devised, but they needed more parts. But one of the benefits of what came after the Rackham snail system is that you could set the clock to strike on demand by tugging a cord, which was very useful at night because obviously you can't see the time at night unless you have a night clock. But that has its own problems, such as causing buildings to burn down. Okay, so now let's take a clock, the clock apart and have a look at some of the components a bit more closely. So I think I'll take off the count wheel first. Just need to pop a pin out. And there we have it. You'll see on the back of it is another wheel, which is driven by this small little pinion here. Now, I think I will take the top off. This is the next stage. There we go. And now you can see the balance wheel a lot more clearly and the lead band running around the edge. So let's just, we can, we can run that again just so you can uh, see the clock running. Now we will take that out. Off we come. And there you see the verge. These are our pallets that I showed you earlier, which are part of the escapement. And now with the escapement out, if we decide we want to run the clock, it will just spin through freely. Now 
Now we need to take our striking set of lever out. So another pin to come out. And we've got this rather lovely little latch here that comes up. There we go. There's our next head. Now, let's put this on its back. Take the rest of our motion work off. And this is a rather lovely little wooden wedge at the front here, just slides up and out. Okay, now we can pop the front train bar out. And then out comes the going train. Here's our escape wheel with the pins on it. And I think I'll leave the, the rope in the clock for this purpose of this exercise. But we unhook it from the great wheel and out comes our great wheel. And there you can see the pulley that the rope sits in. And when we're winding the clock, that's the clicking you hear in that little ratchet there. And when the weight is free released, the ratchet engages and tries to pull the wheel around. So that's our going train out. Now turn the clock over. Again, we'll pop the wedge out here. Take the rear train bar out. And out comes our striking train. And this is, again, this is the great wheel of the striking train, similar to what you just saw. Some broken teeth here, that's perhaps one drawback of wooden geared, wooden wheeled clocks, is that the teeth are more fragile. And here on this side you see six pins and these drive the hammer that strikes the bell. And here at the top of the train is actually a fly. And that's doing the job of the controller in the striking train. It's helping regulate the speed at which the striking is happening. It's by no, it's far removed in actually even from the balance wheel we've just seen on the going train. But it, um, all it needs to do is slow the train down enough so that we can count the strikes. So there we have it. Our clock is now in bits. That was the easy bit. Now I'm going to try and put it back together. So here we go. Now we're ready to hang the clock back on its stand and the moment of truth, will it still tick? Put the counterweight on first. So then we've taken this lovely clock apart and put it back together again without any tools and it was still ticking at the end. Thank you for watching and if you like this video please do subscribe to the British Museum YouTube channel.